Hi there. We're here in Dallas, Texas today at Killer Vintage Specialty Guitars with Dave Henson. And Dave Henson is the man responsible for this place as he is another one in St. Louis. So we thought we'd ask him a few questions and learn a little bit more about this shop that's located close to Lemon and Mockingbird in the Dallas area, close to Love Field. So Dave, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. So nice to be here. Lots of guitars. That's my favorite place. Uh, lots, lots of guitars. Of, lots of eye candy in guitars. Exactly. Uh, some pretty rare guitars as well. A few. They come and go. Yeah. So how do you deal with the separation anxiety of letting go <clears throat> some of these guitars? You know, I don't get attached to them. So you don't need Individual professional help guitars? at all? No. Well, I'm beyond, way beyond help. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could help me. Well, uh, there's still hope. There's still hope. I'm still here. There's still something. But how many guitars do you have in the shop here? Uh, it's probably about 50, 40, 50 here. It's probably about 100-something in St. Louis. Well, speaking of specialty, what specialty are these guitars? Well, we try to stay with vintage, uh, hard, semi, and some rare, hard-to-find instruments. Um, anybody can sell new stuff. That's right. It's not hard to do. Um Although we do sell new instruments here, Collings and new Gibson Custom Shop. <clears throat> um, and those, actually the Gibson stuff, we pick out, hand pick. So it's not just getting stuff shipped and selling it like widgets. We actually pick the guitars that come in here. Well, I would imagine. Mark if... and I are both good players and understand what people are looking for or what we like, which usually translates to others as well. How long have you been at this location? Since, uh, well, I got this, acquired this location in April. We actually opened in October. It took a while to do the build out and whatnot. And what is your process about for obtaining some of these rare, rare guitars? Well, sometimes guitars come to me. <laughs> That's serious. Nice. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always looking. I never stop. I mean, I'd rather, odd as it sounds, find the guitar than sell it. It's about, yeah. it's about the hunt, it's hunting the guitars, finding the guitars. For me, it would be the separation anxiety. Yeah, I don't get attached. I have my dozen or so guitars that I, if I can't take a guitar out and play it on a gig, I don't keep it. I'm not the guy that has the, uh, look, it's, it has the tag is, don't right. even look at it. I right. don't want that. I don't have that guitar. I don't want that guitar. Well, I know you don't want to do that, but can you at least tell me what your favorite guitar is here in this shop? You know, I have odd choices, again, because I play. Mm -hmm. um, this is one. A friend of mine designed this back well, in the late 90s. <clears throat> there was a guy named Kurt Linhoff. Kurt had a store in Houston, 70 till about 74 or so. Um, Anyway, it Kurt's another story for another another day. But anyway, Kurt always thought that if you turn the pickup the other way on a Telecaster, you could get the Hendrix tone. Because that's what Jimmy, because he played left-handed, the pickup oh, was facing the other way. I see. Your high strings are further away from the bridge, so they're not quite as piercing. The low strings are closer. So it's a little crisper low end, a little smoother high end. <laughs> Such a simple so solution. The, he made about 100 of these um, between 2000 and 2004, I think. Um, no, probably 2006. Jay Black, who is a master builder at Fender Custom Shop, is the one who made all these guitars. This is one of my favorites, the contour body. I was noticing the cut on the so contour. It's contoured there. like a strap, but it's a Tele, right. which is my first choice guitar. I'm a, I'm a Tele guy. Tele's and 335s are my two favorites. And this is just a great, <clears throat> great sounding bar bar guitar or wherever it's beautiful how much would a guitar like that these are around three grand new this is number 0070 made on earth and that was kurt's slogan his, uh, or his company was pre-nixon electrics <laughs> kurt believed that 68 was the end of good guitars that might when, be right nixon for a while nixon caused it all <laughs> He opened up trade with China. China, right. That would be the first and thing, he, right? And everybody started using plastic wire and polyurethane finishes. I'll be damned. It's so, so political when you don't use Nixon, Nixon ruined everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, are there some other guitars around the shop here you'd like to 
Oh, there's some Show great us guitars. it of, of particular interest or that you We can just like. go down the wall if you Let's want. Let's do that. This is a 1960 Rickenbacker 330 with a Capri body, which is fairly rare. Really cool guitar. You don't see many of these. Um, this 360 R330, but the Capri body is the thicker body without the contour on top. That's beautiful. The knobs are pretty interesting, too. They're oven knobs. Like the, you'll see those on like John Lennon's early guitars. That's his... 325 had these kind of knobs the first era of those it's pretty thick for a thin line mm -hmm. it's a semi hollow beautiful but it's before they went to the rounded top like you normally see on ricks what else we got we got lots of stuff what do you want <laughs> well i guess i'd like to know which was your favorite 335 why don't we go to that uh i can go get it hold on all right, we're back, and this time with a 335. It's a Dodd 335, it's so a, I... It's a 1960. I got this guitar in 1970. It was... It's kind of a weird... Well, it was tip, pretty typical. I mean, these were used guitars in 1970. There was no vintage guitars then. Right. Or they weren't considered vintage. They were sold guitars. Hell, a 57 Chevy was a used car then. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> this guitar... Uh, the guy wanted 200, he had two of them. He had a cherry one with a custom made plaque and a factory Bixby, and he had the sunburst one with pearl dots, which the factory would do either or. Um, he wanted 200 bucks a piece for him. I didn't have that. Well, I did, I had enough for one, but I talked to him into selling both of them for 350. I borrowed money from my dad, bought the pair of them for 350, sold the red one to a rock star for 350 and kept this one. And I played it in bars and clubs and whatnot. It's been changed tuners and, re and back when the next been refinished. It's been refretted, but it's a great guitar. It's also the guitar that's in the Oswald picture. Oh, it is famous then. It's that, the guitar, the Dallas homicide detective J.R. Lavelle is holding in that picture. This is one of my favorite guitars. I can, it's funny, when you have a guitar long enough, that, you play differently on that one. Like, there's things that, that happen on this guitar just because I've had it for nearly 50 years that I don't do on other guitars. And the Bixby tailpiece. The Bixby works great, and there's nothing wrong with these. A lot of guys don't like them, but if they're set up right, if your nuts cut right. You never right. worry about them pulling them out of tune? Nope. Well, that's nice. Nope. It's all about the setup. If they're set up right, they're fine. And what? pickups are those they're PAFs they are yeah it's all original in your gut wise that's wonderful what is this what is this one worth today I don't know I mean a it's dot, had some 1960 stuff done to dot? It. probably 20 ish right 20 grand ish I mean because it's had different tuners on it it's got holes it's refretted but it's not for sale either so the price makes no difference does it doesn't it value doesn't no nah. No, sentimental <laughs> Right, not for sale, absolutely. But sentimental reasons alone, I'll, I'll never sell that guitar. It's been with me too long. I know what that's like. Or not too long. It's been with me a long time, put it that way. Tellies are your other favorite guitar. They are. Uh, right now, we're kind of low on Tellies. Didn't Here. see. We just got a 68 with the Bigsby over there. Oh, that's nice. Can that's, we that's look That's a at really them? good guitar. We have the identical guitar in St. Louis without the Bigsby, a 68 also. So, your choice, with or without. Not have bad. It your, have it your way. And that guitar is worth how much, or how much is, would it take to uh, Like acquire? five grand. Oh, that's not bad. No. Not bad at all for a piece of history like that. And it's a, the maple cap, which Fender did in this era. Um, normally, maple neck strats have a skunk stripe where they put the truss rod in right. the back. During this era, they actually made a maple fingerboard like a rosewood and put on the guitar, so there's no skunk stripe on the back of these. I'll be damned. That's interesting. All right, moving on, do you have uh, Les Pauls that you might I have want to show us? We have new Les Pauls. Finding old Les Pauls is not easy, and those guitars don't usually get displayed. There's sort of a underground market for those guitars. They don't. If you see a, generally, saying, if you see a 58, 960 Sunburst Les Paul, 
on somebody's website or on eBay, Reverb, whatever. Right. It either has problems or it's not right somehow. That's all I can say about that. Generally, the real ones, especially the ones with a lot of flame, kind of go behind the curtains. Right. Always. And with that, within that circle that we hear about. It's a limited buyers that are going to spend 250000 up for a guitar. And those guys dem generally don't buy guitars on, you know, mass places like that. Those, are, those guitars are sold with phone calls. Right, right. And that's... Now the cool, there is a cool, this black junior. I was going to ask you about that. What is this? It's a nice junior, but it looks pretty old. This is a reissue of one of my guitars. Gibson uh, Custom Shop did that? Gibson Custom Shop had a thing called the Collector's Choice series that they did. Uh, maximum usually is 300 uh, per model. This one is the Dave Henson model, Collector's Choice number 19. You're kidding. So this is a remake of my guitar, which I have in back. But they put all the chips and it checking is chip. and everything. It is chip. That's not paint. That's, that's exactly the way it, mine is. We can get the, uh, that out in a minute. But um, this is probably one of the best Collector's Choice custom shops they ever did. This guitar is so close to the original, it's unbelievable. Sound, play, feel, and obviously look. They really nailed it with this. Now, how long have you had that original guitar that they based I bought off of? The original, probably about seven years ago, six years ago. Mm -hmm. It was on Craigslist in Illinois. Yeah, I met the guy in Springfield, Illinois. Looked at it, took it apart, and bought it from him. Um, <laughs> it's had a few, few close encounters of people wanting to buy it, but deals that didn't go through. So how much would that guitar go for? How much does these are fifty two, ninety nine mm -hmm. for the reissue, and the, the original, original is not, for, not sale. for sale. Right, that's I figured that. <laughs> it, it was offered a few times, but the guys that were interested, for some reason or another, didn't. It didn't happen, which is fine with me. Right, I have no problem <laughs> keeping the guitar, especially a really good one. Well, let's move on to. Uh, I don't know, let's move on to strats, shall we? Sure. Your favorite strat? I'm not a strat guy. Right. Um, I have one, but I'm not really that, that's not my first choice guitar. I love to hear other people play strats. Mm -hmm. I don't like the way they, they just don't work for me. Ergonomically, they just don't work for me. You I don't wouldn't... like the middle pickup. I don't like where the volume control is. It's just not for me. You don't have anything like a 54 or anything like that, do you? We did. We just sold You're a 54. I'll be. Uh, this is a 56 here. That's a 56 there. That black one's interesting. That was a that guitar had been stripped and painted about four different colors when I got it. I sent it to Jay Black, who was, I told you was the Gibson uh, Fender Custom Shop master builder. For He's the one who started the whole Relic series in the early okay. 90s. Right. So I sent it to Jay and when Jay got it he called me and said hey man we need to do this black. And I said why black? And he said because it's the same dates as Clapton's Blackie. It's 1056 neck, 1056 body. Really? So that's how it ended up being black and it's a really good guitar. I wish I liked Strats more. Right? <laughs> but I don't. Well I guess that pretty much wraps it up for Strats. And that's a sick, these are both 60, one's a 60, one's a 61, that's 61, 60, and this one's a 61 also. So, and then this one's a reissue of a 69. I, funny enough, I bought this guitar from Joe Walsh in November. Joe was selling a bunch of stuff out of his locker. It's probably something Fender gave him. Right. That I bought like seven guitars from Joe. That was that's one of them. But still, would that add a little value to the guitar? The fact that Joe Walsh had it? Not really. I mean, he didn't play it. Not, not, yeah, never had it on stage. So probably never. not. Probably not. Joe has a lot of guitars still. That's a '73 Strat. Kind of cracked up in here a little bit. That's not unusual. That's pretty thick polyurethane finish. Mm -hmm. it, those tend to do that. I've seen some Les Pauls. A friend of mine, Chris Rodriguez, has one. He's from Nashville. It was in the flood. Right. It actually was damaged I was there, by it. I was there in the flood. Where? I was trapped. 
in the flood for three days. There was a guitar show in Leapers Fork, which is south of Nashville. Um, and I drove down that Friday. It's a weird, it was a weird circumstance. A really good friend of mine who was Amy Krantz's guitar player, Will Owsley, killed, committed suicide that night, Friday night. A friend of mine called me and I almost turned around and didn't go. Anyway, I went to the show the next morning. It was pouring down rain. Joe Glazer and I had brought all the guitars there and Marty Stewart's collection, the Clarence White Tally, everything was there. For Lloyd Lores, I mean, it was it was, it was was an impressive collection, but it was pouring down rain. Vince Gill called me and said, hey man, are you down there? And I said, yeah, but don't come down here. It's getting nasty. Well, Vince came down and then he called me. He said, man, I'm, I'm leaving. I said, I don't blame you. Well, I stayed the rest of the day and they, uh, they had told me early in the day, parked down by the bridge. Well, I don't follow rules very well, so I didn't do it. I left my car right in front of the gallery where the guitar where the uh, guitar display was. It was an art gallery. Um, if I'd parked down there, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had a truck because everything was gone. Oh. It was like eight cars washed down the river. Um, they were telling us tornadoes, get go to the basement. At one point, there was everybody was in hiding in basements. There was a tornado like a mile away. And deputies came to Joe Glazer and I and, and said, "You guys got to get out of here." There's a spotted a tornado, and I looked at Joe and I said, "If the guitars go, I'm going. I'm not moving." Right. So Joe and I stayed there. Fortunately, nothing happened, but I was prepared to die for the guitars. Well, on Chris's guitar, it cracked it up. The finish. Right. It's a gold right. top. It was probably a sound, sound check, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it now has character, and he plays it right. all the time. And he's got Irvin, that little bit of history in there. Keith Urban lost cracks. the gold top too that weekend. Right. I think Joe Glazer restored it, but it was he'd paid a, just a ton of money for that guitar, and I'm sure he had insurance. But I was busy doing insurance appraisals for a lot of guys. I mean, a bunch right. of Vince Gill and Keith and who, whatnot. Well, who better? You know your values. Right. I have no other skills. <laughs> I can't do anything else. You're a player. I can't do anything else. Just You're a player. Guitars. <laughs> you do it well. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's look at an SG or two, shall we? We don't have. We had. We do have an old SG. Um, the first era SGs were actually Les Paul models. Right. Which is what this is. This is a '61. SG Les Paul is what it was called. Or as a friend of mine, Kurt Linoff, who I mentioned earlier, called Les G's. <laughs> yeah, this right tailpiece the... was horrible. That will, if you touch it, it goes out of tune. Really? If you look at it, it goes out of tune. The best thing to do is fold that back and don't ever touch it. And PAF? These are PAFs, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they're cool guitars. They have a little bit more electric sound than a Les Paul. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sort of a because the body's so thin, it's basically wooden pickups or strings and pickups. Is that kind grittier? Of. Yeah, it's a little more piercing, a little more aggressive sounding mm -hmm. than a Les Paul. Somewhat high end, more high well, end. Output. Would you compare it to a deluxe and with the mini humbuckers? I never that bite? liked those guitars. Mm -hmm. That's I'm a big Epiphone nut, and I love mini humbuckers, but I don't like the Les Paul deluxes. On your other My personal preference. I'm sorry, didn't you? That's right. The SG. Now this is a reissue. I see. This is a new VOS. And these are five grand. These are really, really good guitars. This is a better vibrato. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Than the others. No kidding. Well, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, Les Pauls if you'd like. Unless there's something right here you want to look at. Uh -oh. Of course, you got the new Collins. We have new Collins. And these are awesome guitars. Collins makes a great, great mm -hmm. guitar. I love them. And this Junior. This is another Joel Walsh guitar that we bought. It's an artist, probably from around 2008, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. 2007, all the 7.7s seven were artist guitars. So this is another one we got from Walsh that I'm sure he never played. Pretty. But I love juniors, especially black juniors. Yeah, that particular one. And these are, again, our new Gibsons. <coughs> from custom shop, which we only do the custom shop. We don't do the USA, but Gibson's in transition right now, so we don't know exactly what is going to happen. 
you know, most of the guitar shops I go into have less Pauls. I don't see any up here. Well, a One, few. Two, three, a four, few, five, but do you have six, anything in the seven. back? No, I don't. You don't have Those anything behind all. this wall over here. We've got cool guitars back there, some you'll never ever see. That's we what go I was around? talking about. Sure, let's go. Thank well, God. There's another one. Uh-uh. And there's another one. They're everywhere. Oh, man. Yeah, this was the one I'd seen. Those are, are these, all, all the new ones? No, this is from 2003. Gibson made 750 Les Pauls with Brazilian rosewood fingerboards, which has been illegal since really 63, but effectively 69 is when they stopped officially using it. Um, they were, did a run of 750 of these. This is an entire collection of each reissue year with Brazilian. Really? which is really rare to find a full set. So you have a, a reissue 54, a reissue 56, a reissue 57, a reissue 58, a reissue 59, and a reissue 60. All with Brazilian rosewood fingerboards. Amazing. And they're available as a set for like 50 grand. For the set? For the set. That's not bad. Yeah, six guitars. That's for not 50 bad. Grand. Why not, right? Good investment, good investment. Uh, what about old Hickory? Oh, they made a few of those out they of that did. guitar. Print of has that tree. one. Yeah, Vince, had, Vince Gill had one of those. His got destroyed Oh gosh. in I the flood. Know. That was in the down at Soundcheck, in his locker. I forget what I praised that. It was, it was like 12 grand or something, right. I think. Somewhere that's about, in that neighborhood. That's what I remember. Yeah, it was great story there. though. Yeah, yeah, they're not a great guitar. Right. Hickory's not a really good wood. It's better. Really bright. I played it and it was incredibly better, bright. It's better for barbecue <laughs> than for guitars. It's interesting, but now there's some other guitars over here that I find extremely unique. <coughs> I've yeah, always are, uh, been kind of a gambling kind of guy, so I noticed the dice is, I've pickups. never, ever seen another guitar like this. This is probably made by Supro or National or Balco, one of the Chicago companies. This was made under a house brand called English Electronics Tone Master, which there was some music store and all their stuff made under that name, which a lot of music stores did that. There's a, there was, um, I'll show you one of those in a minute. But I've never, this has, a five-way switch for each set of pickups so you can have this one on and that one on or however you can have those two and these two it's bizarre that is incredible a really really cool guitar it actually sounds and plays good i don't know why but it reminds me a little bit of those bongo basses i guess i've never seen anything quite like this before. yeah no that's totally unique what is that guitar what would it take to walk out of here with that guitar? $3,500. Really? Have something totally unique. And I, can, I can honestly say, if you don't like the price, go find another one. <laughs> <you want>. <laughs> um, what else? These are the, you know, you see a lot of the dual tones. This is Hendrix's first guitar, actually. One of, that one's not, but that was one of those. That's what he, his purportedly first guitar. Really? Super dual tone. Now, what years were they manufactured? So early, late 50s, early 60s. I see. This one, 59, this one is. Very nice. Big bat, big neck, it looks well, like. These got really pop. Oh, these kind of guitars got really popular with Jack White. We played all kinds of stuff like that. There was a big sort of surge in prices and interest in those kind of guitars then during the White Stripes. And Right, that. right, right. That's what he used a lot of that stuff. What do we have here? A K? This is a K. Thin Must be swing. a country version or something. Huh? No, this is the Jimmy, known as the Jimmy Reed guitar. Oh, really? This is what he used. I'll be damned. This is a uh, 1960. Oh, so it's an authentic 60. It's yeah, not it's a, a real issue. It's a real one. It's a really good shape. It's that crazy price. It's like 1,900 bucks. Yeah, that's an incredibly good price. And these sound really cool. I mean, you can want that. Jimmy Reed Blues. Right. That's it. That's the guitar. Uh, <coughs> silver tone. I forget what the model is. You know what the model is on? 1484. 1484 or something like that. 
This is a 64. Uh, it's generally, commonly known as the Chris Isaac guitar. Oh, yeah. That's what he used. It These takes pickups were supposedly made by Gibson. Mini right? humbuckers with stacking yeah. holes. Yeah, I remember seeing those in the Sears catalogs, I think. Right. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Pretty hot pickups like the minis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, I love the mini pickups. Feedback a problem on that guitar? Oh, it can be. Any hollow bodies. Mm -hmm. 1446 is the model number of that guitar. So if you find one of these and you want one, you should buy it. And was it Amber Glow, uh, Rick? The Fire Glow. Fire Glow, right. Amber Glow the 12 is, string. is the natural finish. Beautiful. So, yeah, this is a reissue of the the 360 12 OS double bound. This is the Hard Day's Night guitar. Yeah, yep. yep. If it's in tune, I can do that chord maybe. Couldn't do that. You need the other. You need somebody to play a D. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Get Gary in here. Um, but these, this is 3500. This is a new old stock guitar. An original one of these are really rare. This is the George Harrison Hard Day's Night guitar. Right. I sold, the last one I had was about five years ago. I sold for 20 grand for one of these. For the 12 string, 360? This one, exactly. Yeah. Only a, a 1967. Right. And oddly enough, the serial number on that one was GH, which is August hmm. 67. G for 67 and H was August. But it was kind of cool. George Harrison GH. Right. Very cool. I see. I see. It took me a little while. Yeah. But there you we go. got it. <laughs> yeah. So right. Speaking of house brands, I'm going to slide. You got something else you want to pull out? Well, there's a house brand. And this is called Dwight. That were um, Epiphone made these for Gibson for music store. That's when Gibson owned Epiphone. But there was a music store in East St. Louis called Sunny Shields Music. Sunny Shields' real name was Dwight, so he had all of his guitars made for students under the Dwight name. The biggest claim to fame on these, aside from being a great coronets, the Epiphone coronets a great guitar. It's sort of the poor man's Les Paul Jr. But this, the Dwight was. The guitar Steve Marriott used mm. in Humble Pie and Faces. He got one of these from Bob Heil. There was a music shop in, you know, we're in uh, just east of St. Louis in, in uh, Marissa, Illinois. Yield Bob Heil's Yield Music. Bob was the guy who perfected the talk box, the Heil talk box That's that one Walsh that and familiar. Frampton used. Right. Um, he also did a lot of PA stuff. I remember going over there when we were kids. It was about a two hour drive because there was no super highways then. It was in no interstates, so it'd take two hours to get over to Marissa. But you walk in, you know, six, it was probably around 69, 68. We'd go over to Bob Hiles' place and it was just packed with stuff. And he'd be on the phone and he'd go, Hey, I'm talking to Jimmy Hendrix. I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Then he probably was because he didn't. That's why Hendrix used all the, Bob designed a lot of the Sun amplifier stuff. Right. So, but the Dwight is a pretty unique brand that came out of East St. Louis. So you got two of those. I got two of those. Those are not for sale. Not for sale. <laughs> no. It's, and it's, you also have a base over there. Is that a match to it? No, that's, I don't know where, I think these things were maybe made in Chicago. It says made in USA. It's a Kappa Continental. Hmm. It's a really cool sounding base. Really? But I don't know. Nobody really knows much about where these things came from. I just liked it because it sounds really good. It's nitro finish. But how does it sound? It sounds it? great. Can you describe it? Is it flexible? It Is sounds it the way you want a Hofner to sound, but they okay. don't. It sounds somewhere between a Hofner and a P bass. Uh, that's interesting. It sounds really, really good. Is the that pickups one for in sale? exactly the right spot. Well, everything's for sale for a price. But well, sure. What would your price? How big? And I don't. I haven't heard it yet. Okay. <laughs> you won't hear it from me, that's for sure. It would have to be above my pay grade. And before we get out of here and go sit down and have an extended conversation, mm -hmm. if you're ready for that, sure. you've got some interesting amps down here on the floor. I see a Selmer down there. Yeah, that's the kind Selmer's of interesting. One of my favorite. 
You only get the, I got all those, well, you get them from in, in England. You can't get, rarely turn up around here in the States. But the Zellner is really cool because that was the uh, sort of the well, it was McCartney used the Selmer. This is the Zodiac 50. He used the Thunderbird, which is the Zodiac 50 with reverb. This just has tremolo. With two twelves also. Mm -hmm. Same amp, except it has reverb in it. But the, that amp sounds amazing. I'll, I'm a, Mark and I are both big fans of the old Gibson amps, like the Les Pauls and the GA20s and whatnot. The Les Pauls. I'll be known. Yeah, that's a 54. That's beautiful. They did some interesting circuits, especially that era. They're really a little bit weird, especially amp guys hate those things because they're all, they're just weird homage. And I mean, that one actually has a three ohm output. You're kidding, how many watts? They're like 20 watts. Mm -hmm. But they're just, they're really weird to work on. I know my amps pretty well, but what is that? That's a Gibson GA40, which is a later model Les Paul. Yeah. That's probably from late, like 57, 8, somewhere in that era. That's the last of the two-tone, which is the stuckle with brown. Right. After that, they went to sort of the white Tolex. Do you and have they actually went smaller and tweed. They did a lot of tweed. Uh, like, here's one here. So, the tweed, the Ranger. That's from the late 50s up till about 61, they used the tweed covering on their amps. Very nice. Interesting, and Univox. Univox, <laughs> we're made in New York. Eventually they went to Japan, but these New York ones are really, they're not high power, but for recording, they're amazing sounding amps. Uh, Jeff Beck used those. Didn't Paige use one or two, I think. I know Beck used them for a while. Um, but yeah, they're, these are really, really underrated amps. They sound like Marshalls, only it's low volume. Not a lot of headroom, no. No. They just, you just crank them up and go. They sound great, though, for recording. How much is that one? Oh, uh, those are like 600 bucks. So that's great. They're not crazy. They're cra that's great. It's, it's are, are there any in the back around this other wall? Vintage. That you want to show us? Um, there's stuff everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, y'all ought, ought to get down here because you could spend some time looking at these guitars. Just spend some money while you're here, and I think uh, I think Dave will be We're okay never opposed, with that. Never opposed to that. Okay. Well, you can come spend your money down at Louie Louie's on Monday night. I'm down there on Monday night. I know night. you If are. I'm in town, I'm here. I love playing with this guy. Very good player. Unique. I have fun. All Here's right. some more of the Tweed Gibsons. This is a 50... Gibson GA25. This guitar, is a John Bolin. John Bolin's the guy who makes all the stuff for Billy Gibbons, all the crazy oh, guitars. Yeah. Right. Uh, John made this for, actually, this is a version of the guitar that John made for Neiman Marcus's fantasy catalog two years ago. Oh, really? I, I set up a deal with Neiman Marcus for the Texas Guitar Trio, which was uh, Lyle Lovett had <coughs> Collings making guitar for him, um, Billy Gibbons had Gibson making guitar for him. And John Bolin made one for Steve Miller, and that was the Steve Miller that guitar. <clears throat> Those went for thirty thousand dollars a piece, which included a huge donation to charity. But uh, the other part of it was you'd go to the show of the artist, they'd play your guitar, and then give it to you at the end of the show. Which, which is kind of cool. And they sold a couple of the Billy Gibbons, I think three of the Billy Gibbons, and one of the Steve Millers. What's the inlay there? What's that read? Steve Miller or something? Uh, that one says nothing. Literally, it says nothing. That's... <laughs> Which is kind of cool. Yeah, for people like me that get, that get suckered into it. What does that, that say? That nothing. Ask the question. What does that say? Nothing. <laughs> well, you know what the story of that was. No. Tell us, Gary. Oh, they said he, the guy that that, uh, that was made for, <clears throat> when he ordered it, uh, Boland said, what do you want in the 12th fret? And he said, ah, Nothing. But like literally, he didn't want anything. Right. right. So, but John, John Bolin put nothing. Yeah. And well, actually, this guitar was made for a really famous Dallas chef uh, named Dean. Dean Faring. Faring. This is Dean Faring's guitar that we took. I'll be darned. Because he was his uh, fiance Wanda was the CMO for Neiman Marcus, and that's who I set up the whole guitar deal with through. <clears throat> that was in 2015. 
is when we did that. Oh, 14 is when we did that. Um, so that was cool. The orange Epiphones are a really rare custom color Epiphone. They did three colors for Epiphone in 64 and 65. California Coral, which is that color. There's sort of a silver blue that's called Pacific Blue. It's similar to Lake Placid okay. or Pelham. Right. And then the other one was Sunset Yellow, which is bright school bus yellow. And I've had one of those. But the, the orange is the hardest one to find. But And then there's a, an Epiphone coronet similar to the Dwight we looked right. at earlier, but the color of that is called Silver Fox, which is a green grain really? filled finish nice and of course you got your double neck sg it's the hotel california guitar that one actually has the felt don felder mod with the extra jack that is just for the 12 string to go do a different amp makes sense but the red ones are the ones everybody wants of those that's the jimmy page right one and then up there behind you there's a relic 57 R7 reissue 57 uh, relic by RS Guitar Works. On the far left is a 1960, mm. probably uh, Les Paul custom and and or known as the Black Beauty. Right. In the center is a 1961 Epiphone Sheraton in blonde, mm. which is one of the rarest guitars you'll find. How and much would that my, be? That's twenty five thousand beautiful it's gorgeous with the hang tag in the original case and the vibrato on there too yeah <clears throat> a lot of guys don't like that but it really doesn't do anything so well you're still it's still like a stop bar i mean it got it on top of the block right, you get the resonance don't touch it <laughs> just don't touch it 